Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, I'm Cassandra. I'm an alcoholic. Uh, I don't know why today, but I'm feeling extra insecure. Um, a lot of times if I share and I just am honest to start with, I'll stay honest throughout my share, so I just wanted to say that. Um, congratulations to everyone who came to this meeting, uh, especially the people with 90 days or less, whether or not you introduced yourself. Um, when I came in, I didn't want to be here at all. And um, sometimes I still don't want to be, but we all showed up. It's a Saturday night, and I think that's a reason to celebrate. And um, I'm really glad that I don't have to do this alone. And um, that's what attracted me to Alcoholics Anonymous is that I didn't have to figure out everything on my own anymore, and I couldn't. Um, So a little about what it was like. Um, From what I've learned by reading the big book and doing the steps, the spiritual malady that's described, um, I've had ever since I can remember. Um, I remember being really fearful as a kid, uh, having a lot of questions about, like, death and just all this, like, philosophical things that, like, no other kid seemed to be having or talking about. And um, the message that I received, whether it was real or fancied, was that I was too sensitive, I was too emotional, and it made me feel like who I was wasn't okay. And um, I think a lot of that was in my own head, and there may have been messages that I think uh, were sent to me, but that's kind of what stuck with me. And uh, there was one incident in particular when I was a child that made me really uh, believe that even more, that I was broken. And I held on to that belief. And before alcohol was ever introduced, uh, I self-harmed. I started self-harming at around 10. And I did that for the same reason I drank, uh, because I wanted to control my feelings and I wanted to control my pain. And if I was going to be in pain, it was going to be the way I wanted it to be. And I was so tired of feeling powerless and that my life was out of control. And shortly after that, I started drinking. I was a blackout drinker from the beginning. I never drank for any other reason than to not feel my feelings and to not feel that fear that was so intense in me ever since I can remember. And I remember the first time that I drank that my fears of what people thought of me, my fears of what I thought of myself, uh, who I was as a person, I didn't care about anymore. And I could be who I thought was a more acceptable person who wasn't as sensitive. Um, And I also had this belief system that there was acceptable feelings and those were being positive. Um, Anger was was not okay. It was in the non-acceptable feelings, being sad was unacceptable. And so I had a very small range of things that I felt I was allowed to feel both in and out of the home. And when I drank, like, I didn't care what those unspoken rules were anymore. And um, I quickly got to a bottom and I didn't go to a program right away and I didn't get sober. And um I spent the, I spent 13 years drinking and using drugs and using people and um, it never got better. And even like the small periods that it talks about of it sometimes feeling controlled, like it was always followed by more pain and a lot of harm that I caused myself and others. And I couldn't see any of that. And uh, because of certain events in my life, I felt very entitled to drink. I felt that I deserved to have a drink, that I deserved to feel better, that people in my life deserve to be punished, and that they deserve to for to like have my wrath. And um, I didn't care about anyone but myself. And um, yeah, it was really painful. And I did my first geographic when I was 15. Like I switched high schools because I had burned a lot of bridges. And, um, you know, something my sponsor taught me is everywhere I go, there I am. And that's really been the case for me. And I've had a few other geographics since then, and it's always the case that for a little bit things seem to get better. And then they don't get better anymore. And um, 
yeah, just the demoralization that came from that. And it's really evident to me now as I work my program, like how many people I hurt and how I didn't stay in integrity with myself. Um, I always felt like people were abandoning me, but often case I was abandoning myself. And so it's been interesting to look at things now. Um, so kind of what happened was last year I ended up in another 12-step program uh, last July because I was able to admit that the relationships in my life weren't working. But, you know, as a kid, I felt pride in being an alcoholic. Like, to me and my friends, that meant we were tougher. That meant we could, like, handle our shit. And, like, I had such a skewed perception of what it meant to be an alcoholic that I actually took pride in it. And so uh, I didn't want help for it because I didn't think there was any other solution. I just thought life was really hard and like, this is how I was going to live the rest of my life. And so when I came into that other 12 step program, I started learning about a higher power and that I actually got to choose a higher power of my own understanding. And slowly I got to know women that had a life that I wanted that I didn't think was possible. And, uh, and I didn't work the program. I didn't work the steps at first. Like I just listened. And there was this one woman that, talked about how she had decided to get sober and this program had nothing to do with substance abuse, but she had shared her story that felt very similar to mine. And she had everything that I wanted. She had uh, like a great job. She was respected in the community. She had a family and she looked like everything in her life was great. Yet she was struggling with alcoholism and uh, the way her alcoholism showed up was in not drinking every day, but when she would drink, she was angry, and she was violent, and um, it was ruining her life, so she stopped, and so it kind of planted the seed for me that there was another option, that, you know, there are people that get sober, because that was not something I had ever experienced in my life, and so I uh, stayed in that program, got a sponsor, and started to form this relationship with the higher power, and something just kind of changed for me. Like I no longer felt like I wanted to die, which is how I had felt since probably about like eight years old. And, um, I was really, really scared because of the last few times that I had drank, how my life was going to be. And because I didn't want to die anymore, I figured that like something had to change. And so, um, there was an opportunity for me to move from Orange County to Oakland. And so I did last October. And when I joined my original 12-step program out here, uh, I was 12-stepped. And someone said, like, you might want to look at the way you drink and the way you use drugs. And for whatever reason, I think because I was so desperate and so lonely and didn't have any family or friends or anyone in Oakland that I was willing to do what this person said. And so um, I went to my first meeting. and. I didn't get involved in the program right away. It really scared me to hear what people were saying and, like, what it looked like when you drink your whole life. And uh, I had a lot of fear around that, and it reminded me of adults in my life that I love. And so I chose to not work the program for two more months and just stay uh, dry drunk, and it was miserable. It was uh it was worse than I remembered being a kid, like the way I was feeling and how much self-centered fear I was running on and how angry I still was. And it wasn't a solution that was working. And so on New Year's Eve, like my resolution was to get try AA for six months and give it 100% because I knew that if I at least tried and like said it didn't work, then I would like feel, I don't know, I guess more justified in why I didn't want to do it. And it's been more than six months, and I'm still here. Um, so what that looked like was I got a sponsor. Um, it didn't work out with the first sponsor, so I got a new sponsor. I started working the steps, and I did what my sponsor told me, which was go to 1990, get service commitments, um, call other alcoholics, call her every day for 90 days. And, like, these are all things I despised. And, like, I didn't trust adults, and I definitely didn't trust alcoholics. Like, the alcoholics <laughs> in my life have hurt me. And so to rely on a bunch of alcoholics who, in my opinion, like had already failed me, like was unbelievable, but I was willing to try for six months because I had made that commitment and I'm very stubborn. And so I did it. And, um, you know, what it's looked like is already a life beyond my dreams. Like I don't have any of the things I thought would make me happy. Um, 
but I have a lot of people in my life that I really care about. I get to be a service to AA and specifically young people's AA, which has completely changed my life because I really thought that if I committed to AA that I was signing up for a boring life. And I was so willing to live that I didn't care. Uh, but that hasn't been the case at all. Like, my life is really fun. And I have a lot of really cool and loving and kind people that I get to learn from. And I'm just so grateful for these rooms and that little bit of willingness that I had and to pray for willingness when I didn't have any willingness and just to stay open-minded. And uh, it's it's really worked for me. And so I really hope that uh, all the newcomers are able to give it a chance. And uh, there's lots of different meetings, lots of different sponsors. And, you know, just, I don't know. I guess it's it's just giving me such a great life that I wish it for everyone else, too. So thank you all for being here and for being part of my recovery and keeping me sober. Hello, I am Alex. I'm an alcoholic. Uh, I'm very glad to be at this meeting. I want to thank uh, Cassandra for her uh, share. I also want to welcome all the newcomers. Um, Chances are, if you're here on a Saturday night, you probably belong here. Um, this was not the place that I like would plan to be when I was younger. Like, you know, I'm going to have a really good time at a church, at an AA meeting on a Saturday night, you know. Um, but, you know, I have to say that it works, so I'm glad you're here. I also want to thank uh, Lache for asking me to share, you know. Uh, to be honest, I really wanted to say no when she asked, but she's so nice, and I've known her so long, I was like, fuck. You're the one person that I have to say yes to. Um, anyways, uh, I also want to say that, you know, I am also a little bit nervous. You know, I've also found in these rooms that just, like, kind of saying how you feel. Like, when you hold it on tight, like, it's a little dirty secret. Like, it kind of just, like, it, it stays with you. But the second you let it go, I mean, it goes away. And that's something that I've only really been able to learn in this program. Uh, I used to kind of keep how I felt completely closed off. I didn't let anyone know how I felt. I thought that if anyone knew how I felt, they're going to use it against me because that's what I tried to do to other people. When I knew how they felt, I'd use it against them because that's what I learned and all these, it's an extremely like unhealthy cycle. Uh, and I learned that like a lot of that comes from my ego and a lot of that comes from like my pride and thinking that like I'm so important that if I don't share just right, I'm going to like ruin AA. Like it'll be, like it'll be something like it, it's so goofy that I'm like, you know, like tomorrow morning, like you'll go to look up the meeting and the meeting schedules will just say like canceled. Like, you know, Alex fucked it up. You know, like, uh, then that, <laughs> And, you know, that sounds goofy when I say it, but, like, that's what goes in my mind before I share. I'm like, oh, my God, you're going to ruin everyone's day. Everyone's going to get drunk, you know, tomorrow. Everyone's going to get drunk. Um, but, you know, as I guess I will start at the beginning. Um, I just want to say straight off the bat that I never drank or used drugs normally. Um, from the very beginning, I had some extremely unhealthy uh, habits with drugs and alcohol. And that came from just unhealthy uh, habits with the way I related to myself, with other people. Um you know, I, I'll just brush over really quickly that I grew up in a very dysfunctional family in the sense that there's a lot of abuse, there's a lot of sexual abuse, there's a lot of physical abuse, there's a lot of emotional abuse. Luckily, it wasn't so much with my parents, but like extended family and friends of family. So from a very young age, I didn't learn like how to deal with feelings. I didn't learn like how to say how I felt, how to know that it was okay to feel a certain way. And for a long time, I used that as an excuse to drink, though. And that definitely caused a lot of trauma. That definitely was stuff I had to work through. But as I got a little bit further along in recovery, I learned that that's not why I used drugs and drank, though. I used drugs and drank because I was an alcoholic. And that's something I didn't want to admit for a long time. Because I felt that if I had a good excuse, like, why I drank, like, no, it was this that made me drink. Like, it kind of excluded me from just being a fucked up alcoholic. I was like a fucked up alcoholic with, like, a footnote. I was like, you know, like, like there's the asterisk, then you look down and it goes like, oh, okay, it makes sense. Um, but that wasn't the case. Uh, the first time I ever got drunk, I was like 11 or 12 years old, and my brother and I found out you didn't have to be any specific age to buy homebrew supplies. So we went to this store called Homebrew Heaven in this little town called Everett, uh, by where I grew up, and went to this place called Homebrew Heaven, got champagne yeast and a bunch of apple juice, we got a five-gallon bucket, and we made like the most disgusting cider <laughs> you could ever imagine, and we got hammered, and it was the best thing I've ever done in my life up to that point. Uh, I threw up all over the place, it, and you know what's crazy was like, as horrible as it was, I instantly got sick, I instantly like blacked out, I loved it. And, like, I instantly wanted to do it again, and I continued to do it by myself. It wasn't like, oh, this is a good party. Let me go party with people. It was like I instantly just wanted to do that all the time. Uh, 
And because I was making it, I was, I mean, I just always had like a bucket in my closet. That, and, and that was pointed out to me later, like, do you realize how fucked up that is? Like, like you were, and I would sell it to kids at school and I was like, you were like bootlegging like that. And, and, you know, and, and that kind of just looking back, <clears throat> that made me realize I'm just like, so there was never any doubt in my mind, really, that, like, I had a problem with drugs and alcohol, and it just escalated from there. Um, you know, I will stick mostly to alcohol, because this is Alcoholics Anonymous, but, I, I mean, I use a lot of drugs, and I just can only say that I use drugs alcoholically. Um, you know, if I was shooting heroin, I shot it like an alcoholic, I guess. If I was smoking crack, I smoked it like an alcoholic. You know, it's one of those things that, like, it had the exact same compulsion. If anything, that just shows me how fucked up I am. I didn't even like any specific drug or any specific thing. I just like stuff that took me out of the way I felt and took me out of myself. So, at first, you know, to be honest, like, drinking and using drugs was kind of fun. I was young. Uh... I also didn't really know that there was people that didn't drink or use drugs really heavily until I got older. It was just something around my family that uh, there were people that didn't get high or didn't drink, but they were kind of like the odd ones. You know, it was like they were the ones that was like, you know, what's up with that guy? Um, and I thought it was normal that like any time family gets together, you know, people get drunk and they end up fighting. And it was like I had like an uncle that you could tell how drunk he was because he like held his drinker higher and higher. Like, you know, as he was drinking like and like by the end of the night, it's like way up here. And that was just like what I grew up with. And I didn't know that there was people that did anything else other than that until it was way too late. And I was already so far into it that like I didn't even have the like an open mind to know that that was like an option. Uh you know, I did start having consequences pretty early, though, from drinking. Um, I got suspended from school a lot. I get in a lot of fights. Um, I got suspended from school, actually, for being so drunk. Uh, I threw up on a girl in the middle of math class. Um, and that... <laughs> And at the time, I thought it was funny, um, you know, because I was, it's still kind of funny. Um, but, but, uh, if it had ended there, it would be like a funny story, but like it didn't. So, uh, uh, anyways, you know, I got suspended for that. And like, I remember my parents, like, I think they found my bucket of booze or whatever in my closet at one point, And like, they didn't even know what to say. Like, it was one of those, like, what the fuck? Oh my God. Like, yeah, it was, like, I was so out of control and the rest of my family was so out of control. And I I remember, like, kind of thinking it was a joke at the time, but, like, my mom's type of advice was, like, you know, no needle drugs and wear a condom. Get out of here, you know? And I was just like... <laughs> and <laughs> and I, I, I followed that for a while, but... Um, uh, so, as things progressed, though, like, I, I got really into music, and that also exposed me to a lot of, like, things at a really young age, like, I probably shouldn't have been, and that also kind of, like, skewed my view of the world and, like, what was normal. Um, I started playing drums, and I played in a couple bands, and I'd play, and, you know, I never, like, got big or anything. It was just, like, like little local punk, sh like, shows and stuff, but that exposed me to things, like, when I was a young age, I'd be going into bars, and I'd be going, and I started selling drugs, and I started doing all these things that, like most kids shouldn't be doing and I didn't know that it wasn't normal and that made it so much harder for me later on because like I didn't know that it was even a problem um I uh had a couple friends who like got sober and like I thought they were kind of weird and I didn't really trust them after that you know, it was, I mean I I, I did I, at this point I was still like so stuck into the idea of like uh, live fast die young I don't even want to live to be 30 fuck everything and I really tried to like convince myself I felt that way for a long time and then as I got older like I realized I was like well I'm getting like I'm getting close to that age where maybe I should kick it then you know and I don't want to die you know and by that point, I was so miserable, like, I knew something needed to change. Uh, I uh, ended up, you know, having, like, mild successes. Like, I went to school a couple times, like, started a couple decent jobs. I worked in rest, uh, restaurants for a long time, and I made decent money doing that. And I went to culinary school, and then, like, fucked that all off. And then I started working in other jobs. I started working in construction, framing houses, and I fucked that all off. But because I had these moments of, like, success, I was like, well, but, I mean, I have a job. And... I quit that job because I want to go to this better job, not because there's a problem, but really I was running from everything. And, like, the second a job was going to fire me, I just quit before they could fire me. And then I'd go to some other job, and it was it was extremely unmanageable. But uh, I guess I'll, I'll fast forward a little bit to my first, like, exposure to AA and, like, the idea that there was, like, a different way to live. Um, I had been on a bender for quite a while, and... I was trying to get my life together again, and I was living with my friend's mom, 
on her couch, and he had moved out. So, like, I, my life wasn't in a good spot. I was living on my friend's mom's couch, and, like, my friend didn't even live there anymore. And and he, uh, she, I little did I know, uh, had been sober at that point for, like, 22 or 23 years. And she had known me since I was a little kid, and, like, she... Her idea was like she was going to 12-step me, and in the end, it ended up working, you know. But one day, I was all drunk, and I came in, and I was like, I think I'm an alcoholic. And she was like, I know. <laughs> Fuck. And I thought that would be like the end of it. I instantly felt better. I'm like, glad we got that out the way. And, I was like, and then she asked if I wanted to go to a meeting, and I was like, oh, and I mean, I, I, at that point, like all I was doing was like stealing box wine from Safeway and like drinking all day. So I didn't really have like a good excuse of like I'm busy. Um, and and she knew that, you know, like she knew what I was up to, and she just like was like looking at me like, what are you doing? Um, so I ended up going to a meeting. So like 20 minutes later, I'm sitting in the car and just like staring at my feet, hating my life, going like I fucked up, you know, like I, I know this is gonna change my life, like maybe not now, looking back, but like I knew that was gonna change my mindset on like what I wanted out of life and what. Um, so I went to that meeting and I was really surprised by like the people that were there because I I had like grown up around extremely dysfunctional people and like I had this idea of what drug addiction looked like and what like people who drank too much looked like and like there was a lot of normal like happy people and I was kind of like I'm like you look like a soccer mom like you're not an alcoholic and like you you look I mean you look like you just got off work and you have like your tie in the car but you have like a button-up shirt and I'm like this that's not what an alcoholic looks like like you're an alcoholic is like this dirty punk rock kid who hates life and you know just wants to destroy everything but that opened my mind to like what else was out there and I obviously didn't stay sober from that point on um I, I didn't even stay sober whatsoever. I was drunk when I went to that meeting. I got drunk again that night. And I, shortly after that, I ended up moving out because uh, I don't think she was very stoked on me at that point. Um, and I also wasn't feeling the, like, let's go to meetings thing. Um, so I uh, ended up, what, what ultimately got me into the rooms uh, initially um, was... I had a lot of health problems revolving around alcohol and drugs. And the main thing that happened was on my 25th birthday, um, I ended up, I had been drinking for days and using drugs for days, and I ended up, my kidneys shut down. And I ended up passing out on my floor for about two and a half days straight. And I came to, and I had thrown up so much blood, like my, I had ruptured my esophagus, I had like thrown up so hard there's like blood coming out my ears I had fallen asleep on my side for so long that I had paralyzed my right shoulder my right hip and like I had no idea what had happened I came to and it was like the most disoriented I've ever been in my life um and like the first thing that came to my mind was like someone rushed in here and beat me up like I don't know what the fuck like I looked around I'm like no that didn't happen like I was like did I do this what the fuck um so I ended up calling an ambulance. I couldn't hear anything because there was so much blood in my ears and everything. So I'm just like yelling at my phone, like, I can't hear anything. I'm, this is my address. Come get me, you know. Um, and and the, the, so when the paramedics showed up, my, my front door was locked. And I didn't want them to kick my door down because I knew I'd have to pay for it. So, like, I drug myself to the front door. And I was only wearing pajama pants. And I couldn't hold my pants up because my our arm was paralyzed. I'm calling with the other one. So, like, I opened the door. And I don't know what they thought. But my pants are, like, around my ankles. I'm covered in blood. There's blood, like, down my ears. And I'm like, I can't hear anything. And they're like, oh, my God. And so uh, I went to the hospital. And I, I just remember, though, the the doctors like they had this look of disgust on their face like they just like this doctor like was looking at me and he was like man if you don't get your act together like you will not make it to 30 and like that's when it kind of clicked that uh like I didn't realize the gravity of the decisions I was making and like how quickly this was going to catch up with me and I was on kidney dialysis for like two weeks you know I, I my arm was paralyzed for like six months you know and I had to learn to write with my left arm and like the, the crazy thing though is after being in that hospital for that long and I was completely detoxed when I got out I was only out of the hospital for like two hours before I was back in my room shooting heroin and my arm's not even working at that point I'm like flopping my arm over trying to like do this and I, I just like I'm sitting there like 
it's funny now because I'm alive, but like I, I realized at the time I was like, this is about as bad as it gets. Like, you know, it doesn't really get much worse than this. You know, and I had a lot of health problems prior to that. Like I would like cough up shit that like looked important. It was like <laughs> <laughs> And I remember, like, trying to throw, like, I coughed in my hand when I was driving one time. I tried to throw it out the window, and, like, it hit the window. My friend looked over, like, oh, my God. And, like, I instantly started, like, coughing up a lot of blood. And, like, I was like, I think you might need to drive. And she's like, we should go to the hospital. I'm like, oh, oh, don't mess with my high. Um, you know, so uh, after all that, I did end up eventually, after a couple of times going to jail and going to prison, I ended up getting sober for about a year and a half, but I really didn't want to kind of adopt the program. Like, I sort of, like, was like, all right, well, they say I should go to this many meetings, but I'm only going to go to, like, one meeting a week because I think that's good enough, and I ended up relapsing, and then I was like, well, all right, I'll go to more meetings, and that didn't work, so I relapsed, and then I was like, all right, I'll finally, I'll get a sponsor, but I'm not going to talk to him or do the steps, so I relapsed, and then I was like, all right, I'll do the first step, and then I'm going to stop because this is weird, I, why is this guy talking to me, you know, he's obviously some weirdo, so I'm, and then I relapsed, and finally, like, I bumped my head so many times that eventually... I was just like, all right, this is this is fucking ridiculous. Like, you know, it's going to like kill me, or I'm going to get sober, and I have to make that choice now. Um, and and sadly, I had made that decision, kind of, and I sort of was doing the program, and I ended up breaking my foot really bad, and they gave me Norco's, and I ended up relapsing really bad, and I went back to shooting heroin, and during that relapse, though, I ended up going to prison for four years. Like, I ended up catching a robbery case, and. That was kind of like, the, my, my sobriety date's July 20th, 2015, but I got arrested on July 19th, 2015. So the day after I was arrested was the day I got sober. Um, and I remember, like, I'd been to jail quite a few times before this, and, like, I was going to court, and I was so dope sick, and I told my public defender, like, just fucking whatever deal they give me, I need to go lay down, I don't care. Just you know, and he, goes, he looks at me, he goes, no, like, the deal is 16 years, 85%. And that's where I was like, <clears throat> the whole world just fell at that point. I was, oh my God, like, what the fuck have I done? And, you know, it, uh, my public defender was like, you know, you took a gun and you pointed at people and took the money. They don't like that. You know, like, that's, that's frowned upon. You know, and I didn't like it <laughs> until it was like kind of. And until I put it in that light, like, I didn't even realize, like I said, the gravity of my decisions. Like, I was running around, and I was a fucking menace, and I was acting like an idiot, and I was taking away people's security. Like, you know, I'm sure that, like, people who I wouldn't broke into their house, like, when they got home, they didn't feel safe. Like, I never looked at the consequences of my actions and the way that I was actually affecting people around me. All I thought was, like, poor me, I'm such a piece of shit, I'm such a junkie, I'm so horrible, you know, and I thought that, like, because I was always humiliated, I knew humility, and I knew that what it was like to, you know, I was like, I'm... It's like, I'm a piece of shit. Of course I know what it's like to be humble, you know? Um, and later on, someone told me, you know, it's like, humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking about yourself less, you know? And I realized that even in all those moments of, like, me hating myself and me thinking I'm a horrible person and me just wanting to die and everything, um, I realized that it was still all about me. It was still like everything was focused on me. I never thought about anyone but myself. I never thought about the consequences I had on other people. Like, if I ruined me and three people's lives... I really only focused on the fact that I ruined my life. I didn't really look at anyone else's, you know, and I was like, well, it's your fault. You got around me, you know. Um, you know, and and <laughs> as much as I hate, uh, you know, to say it in a lot of ways, alcohol and drugs did kind of save my life. Um, and that's only because I didn't know how to live with myself and how to deal with myself. And I think that I probably would have killed myself a long time ago if it wasn't for drugs and alcohol just because it numbed the way that I felt. And it definitely wasn't a healthy way to deal with that. But at the time, it was just me doing the best I could with what I had. Um, there were years in my life that the only prayer I ever said was, just, please don't fucking let me wake up tomorrow. Like, I hate this. And alcohol, you know, was the only thing that I knew that numbed that. And I won't say that I was, like, ever truly suicidal. The only time I ever really tried to kill myself ended up so fucked up that, like, it's kind of funny. But it, it uh, I, I was going to drive my truck off a cliff. And I, like, had it all planned out, and I had a couple tall cans and, like, a big crack rock I was going to smoke right before I went off this cliff. And it was super rainy, and it was at night, and this was up in Washington. And I'm like, I'm going to do this. And I ended up spinning out 
as I was going to this cliff, so I got stuck in the ditch, and, <laughs> and I'm sitting there, I'm like, God damn it, you know, so I ended up, and it, it was like a, a gradual cliff, it was something I had to drive off of, I'd probably just tumble if I jumped off of it, so uh, I ended up drinking those beers and smoking that crack and like looking out the woods, and I'm like, fuck, you know, like that's, was like, this is horrible, you know, <laughs> um, so I can't really say I was truly suicidal, but I definitely think that drugs and alcohol saved my life. Um, but uh, anyways, while I was in prison, though, that was one of the things that, like, I really realized that, like, I had to decide what I wanted to do with my life. And it really made me look at myself, and it made me look at, like, the way I related to people. And, you know, it also kind of took that, like, poor me sort of, like, mentality away because I met a lot of good people that were in prison for, like, things outside of their circumstances, and they got way worse consequences than I did. And I'm sitting here, I was like, well, I mean, I was shooting heroin, robbing people. Like, I can't really say that, like, poor me, you know? And so that that kind of, like, forced me to grow up, like, in a really quick way. And it's sad that it took till I was 28 for that to happen, you know? Um, but that's what it took, you know? And I ended up working the steps thoroughly while I was in prison. There's uh, a step work through the mail program that I ended up doing a couple times while I was in there. Um, I ended up also, there's there's a pretty good group of people in recovery in prisons that, uh, you know, I, I, uh, got really tied in with those people. I really was able to avoid a lot of the mess that goes on in prisons just because I was in recovery. And it, uh, in a lot of, in more ways than one, it really saved my life. Uh, and I can say like today, because of that, you know, I have an amazing life and it's only because of this program, you know, like the, the thing is, is that, like, there's so many good things in my life that I never even knew that I wanted. Like, I never had plans before. My only real plan was, like, don't fuck up. Like, <laughs> like my plan was, like, all right, we're going to not shoot heroin. We're going to not drink. And those aren't really plans of, like, action. Like, you know, that that's not really, like, yeah. <laughs> that's not like, all right, so what's your plan this week? You know, it was... So looking back, like, of course, like, I didn't get very far because I never really had a plan. But, like, today, like, you know, I'm I'm going to school for social work, you know, I, uh, I have a full-time job, you know, the, the year and a half I was sober before I got arrested, like, my boss gave me my job back when I got out, because he was like, man, you fucked up, but you're a good guy, you know, and I want you to come back and work for me, and that's something that never would have happened if I hadn't had that taste of recovery before, because he saw, I mean, alcoholics are extremely resourceful people, like, anyone who can make it through life hung over 24-7, like, has some resources the average person can't muster, you know, like, I mean, anyone who can, like, wake up in the tenderloin with no money, no resources, and stay high all day long, and find somewhere to sleep, like, the average person, like, you can say, oh, you're successful, and you have a good job, but if you threw them in that circumstance, like, shit would hit the fan. So, that, that's one thing the program has taught me, is, like, everyone has assets, not everyone is just a liability and play to those assets and like it, your life gets so good like I'm I'm like at the point in school where it's time for me to start thinking about like what university I want to go to because after this next semester like it's time for a university and I'm like that wasn't even on the table before you know that wasn't something that like I even thought was going to be a part of my life like I I thought I was going to die by the time I was 30 you know and that's something that like only because of this program you know I have people in my life today that, you know, are amazing, that, like, I, there's a group of people I go running with every Saturday morning, like, 8 in the morning, like, we went to Lake Chabot this morning, ran, like, 9 miles, and if you told me years ago that I was going to do that, I'd tell you you're fucking crazy, and that sounds like the worst thing that would ever happen in my life, <laughs> you know, I joked, I, like, like, I've run a couple marathons, and I was like, the only way I would ever run 26 miles is if I left my drugs 26 miles away, <laughs> you know, because that's the only way I'm getting up and going, that, you know, so... I would have cut myself so short in life if I had, like, decided what I wanted back when I was in addiction. Like, all I wanted was to be sober and play video games. Like, that was it. Like, if I could just, like, sober up, stop going to jail, and, like, have an Xbox. That was my dream. Like, that was all I wanted. Like, please, just let this, like, happen. Because my... I didn't even know what it was to be happy. Like, I didn't know what it meant to, like, have goals or have something to work towards. And today, you know, uh, I have some really, like I said, amazing people in my life. And... You know, the steps, they do kind of suck, and it's, it's because they work. You know, um, if they were awesome, you know, you wouldn't have to talk someone into it, but, you know, <laughs> if, if it was really fun, like, people wouldn't have to, like, get to the last leg of addiction and, like, be, like, laying in the gutter, like, fine, I'll finally try it, you know. <laughs> um, 
but but they do work. And I think that the steps are something that, to be honest, just make you a better person, whether you're an alcoholic or not. Like the the only thing that says anything about drugs or alcohol or any sort of actual substance is the first step that says you're powerless over them. But then the rest of it is just looking at like how you view the world and how you think you act in the world and then how you actually act in the world and the way other people actually see you in the world. And I realized that did not line up whatsoever. I realized that I was going around causing damage everywhere. Like the one of the most detrimental things you could do was be my friend. And that's because and it's not because I was a horrible person. It's just because I was so destructive and didn't care about myself and didn't care about anything. And uh, eventually life got me miserable enough where I started to care just because I didn't want to be that miserable anymore. But, uh, you know, the steps are something that I have benefited from so much. Um, to be honest, when I first came into AA, I thought it was a Christian cult. Um, you know, I came in and there was always in churches and, you know, I, I was like, grew up, you know, I was into punk rock and death metal, you know, you know, praise the devil, you know, everything like that. And I was like, I didn't, this isn't for me, you know, there, so I came in and everyone's sitting like attentive, looking at someone speaking to them. And then they pass a basket around to put money in. I'm like, check two. You know, there's this cult. And then at the end, you all started holding hands and chanting. And I was like, that's it. This is, it's a cult, you know. Um, but I realized that my view of, like, spirituality was so narrow that I, like, instantly just associated it only with the religion I grew up with, which I fucking hated. I think politics and religion are the two biggest forms of organized crime that have ever existed. <laughs> that's, that's another story. Um, you know, so I didn't realize what it was like, though, to actually be connected to yourself and be connected to other people and think that you had a purpose in this world. And I instantly, when I first came in, would look at other people's ideas. And there are a lot of people that believe in religion in AA, and that's perfectly fine. There's no wrong way to be a better person. I don't think that if, if that works for you, then that is my hat is off to you. Um, for me, it just wasn't the case, though. And it took a long time for me to figure out what that was for me. And looking back, you know, I grew up kind of in the middle of nowhere, and I've always loved the woods, and I, I just, like, kind of made nature at first my higher power. I'd go out in the woods, and I'd climb a tree, you know? And, like, it, first of all, it's kind of hard to be upset when you're in a tree. Um, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> it's true. Um, but I also realized that, like, I just felt okay when I was out in nature, and everything had its place. You know, like, birds kind of just flew around, they did their thing, and they weren't yelling at other things what they should do. They weren't trying to control anything. <laughs> and, like, there was, you know, bugs doing what they were supposed to do. Anyway, there was, like, this natural flow to everything. And when I was out in nature, I realized that, like, I kind of felt at first, like, the first time I ever felt connected to something, I was like, all right, like, I'm... So now, I like, if I'm going about what I'm supposed to be doing, like, I feel like I'm kind of connected to that flow. Like, am I doing what I'm naturally supposed to be doing? Is this natural? Or am I having to make excuses for what I'm doing? Am I having to, like, justify what I'm doing? Am I having to say, like, oh, well, I'm doing this because so-and-so did that, because this is happening? And that's where it's like I'm not going with that natural flow of what I'm supposed to be doing. And if I have to justify something, it's because what I'm doing is probably in some way somehow unjustifiable. You know, if I'm having to justify being not nice to someone, like, well, of course, like, if you're, if you're going to make a decision to be a nice person, it's really easy to be nice to people when they're also being nice to you. But if you make a decision to live a certain way, and it's hard to live that way, that's when it really matters that you decided to live that way. That's what I mean. No one's an asshole when everything's great. But when things are, you know, starting to get a little shitty and you're still making that conscious decision, that's when you find out who you really are. And I realized that, like, I was kind of like a fair weather good guy. You know, like, when things were good, I was a decent person. But the second shit hit the fan, I just went to, like, survival, survival mode and I screwed everyone over around me because I just, I wanted to make sure I was okay. And I realized that, like, I wasn't as good a person as I thought I was. And... I realized that a lot of people aren't quite as good a people as they think they are. And I realized I was just like another human in the human race. And that like, I wasn't a unique, like a unique individual. I wasn't the worst person that ever existed, but I also wasn't like the most fucked up person that ever existed. I was just a dude that had some issues that like had some real hard slaps in the face that made me realize that like you needed to change. And this program has given me that opportunity to do that. Um, you know, so I guess I have about 10 minutes left, so I'll just kind of go over, like, the process of what I went through with the steps, and, um, you know, the first step was really easy for me, just in the sense, that, like, by the time uh, 
I really genuinely took that step. You know, I was like walking into reception in San Quentin and it's kind of hard to like talk yourself into thinking things are manageable when like, <laughs> when you're like, you know, strip naked, squat and cough, you know, that kind of stuff. And so it's like, this is a prison bitch, you know, I'm like, oh my God. Um, so my life's unmanageable at this point, you know, like, it, <laughs> so that was pretty easy for me. Um, you know, the second and third step were kind of hard for me, just in the sense that, like, I really had this misconstrued idea of what spirituality was and a higher power was and what turning my life over was. Um, and I realized that it doesn't have to be anything crazy and profound. It just has to be something that, like, I'm not trying to direct. And, you know, it can just be nature or it can be, if you know, if you're religious, it can be a religion. It doesn't have to be anything specific. But the fact is I was turning my life over my entire life to something that was more powerful than I was, and that was drugs and alcohol. It made me do things that I was not okay with. Like, it made me, you know, I, I sober, if someone asked me, like, is it okay to go steal from people? I'm like, no, of course it's not. You know, if someone says, like, if you don't like someone, can you go punch them in the face? It's like, of course you can. But when I'm under the influence and I get upset or something, that's the first thing you do, you know. It's, and I realized that for years I had turned my life over to a power greater than myself. And that was something that ultimately was for the worse. And I needed to choose something that was for the better. Um, you know, the fourth and fifth step, uh, you know, by the point that I had gotten there, like, there were a lot of people telling me how much they hated me. Um, so I kind of knew that like I had fucked some people over. Um, I knew I created quite a bit of wreckage. Uh, so the fourth step of going through and fearless and searching moral inventory wasn't so hard, but the fifth step was really where it kind of got real. Cause I had to really be honest with someone else, how I felt and also how other people had hurt me and how that made me hurt other people. You know, the saying is like hurt people, hurt people like that's true. Like, Happy people who have a good life don't go around causing wreckage for the most part. If they do, it's called a sociopath. You know, it's not, there's, there's not very many people that actually fall in that category. Most people hurt people because they themselves have been hurt. And I had to, like, admit that to someone. And I didn't come from a place where it was okay to say, like, I'm hurting right now. Like, I'm really upset. And this is why I'm acting that way. And this is why I've acted, you know, for years I have acted this way. And not only that, but, like, I want to also change this because I have to admit something's wrong to want to change it. Um, character defects, when I got to, like, six and seven, I knew I had so many character defects. The big ones were easy to get rid of in the sense that, like, I knew that I was, like, manipulative and I knew that I was destructive and I knew that... But the little ones that uh, I didn't quite want to get rid of were really hard because I made this list and, like, some of the things I thought were assets were actually liabilities like, I was really sarcastic, and I kind of liked that, like, I could, like, cut you down, I was witty, I just fuck your whole day up just with what I said, and I liked that I could do that, and then I'm like, oh, but I, I like that, though, I don't want to give that up, you know, and I realized, though, that that, I had to, you know, and as I was sober a little bit longer, I realized that I, I uh, didn't really like, in a lot of ways, the person I was, and a lot of the ways I acted was because I didn't like myself, you know. Uh, I definitely think that, like, if someone is an asshole, and I was at a meeting earlier today where they talked about this, is it says more about how that person feels about themselves than how they feel about the person they're being an asshole to. And I kind of was an asshole because I hated myself. And I remember one of my first sponsors asked me, what would I do if I ran into myself walking down the street? And the first thing out of my mouth is I would beat the shit out of him. You know, I didn't even know where it came from. I was just like, and that kind of clicked. I was like, oh, I don't like myself. You know, that, that was a pretty good sign that, uh, you know, I, I was in a little bit of self-loathing, you know, and, um, the, the moment that I really though realized was, uh, I had to change was, there's a saying that I really loved that I, I can't take credit for it. I can't remember who told it to me, but it was, uh, your rock bottom is when your life falls apart faster than you can lower your expectations, you know, and <laughs> I had been... <laughs> I had been great at lowering my expectations, you know, I, I did have some decent jobs, and like a good apartment, and then like, you know, I'd spend more money on drugs, and I'd have like an okay apartment, and you know, my car would turn into an older car, and then it turned into a bike, and then my apartment turned into like a crappy room I'm renting, and then, you know, it's like eventually, I was so far down, like there's like I couldn't lower my expectations, I was really good at it too, like there were times where I was homeless, you know. I'd be like, I've, I've joked about this before, but I'd be like living under a bridge. 
And I'd be like, this is a fucking nice bridge. You know, like, this is really good. Like, when it comes to the bridge game, like, I am winning. You know? and, and that was, like, the insanity of it. It was, like, I, I had to lower my bottom so low that, I mean, it, it really was. Uh, looking back now, like, I'm just so glad that I am where I'm at. I'm glad that this program is giving me the opportunity to, like, not only find out who I am and find out, like, what life is, you know, like, life is a very beautiful thing, like, having spent quite a few years in prison, like, deprived of everything, and just seeing, like, some of humanity at its worst, but also some of humanity at its best, and I, I've come to realize that, like, your perspective is your reality, and if you view your life as a beautiful thing, like, it is a beautiful thing, if you view your life as, uh, like, a piece of shit, it doesn't matter what you have, like, it'll be a piece of shit, and I had to make that decision to turn that around, and, like, today, like, there'll be days where I'm on the bus, and I used to hate riding the bus. I was like, the bus is for idiots and losers and drug addicts, and I'm all three. And, <laughs> and, and <laughs> but now, like, I'm on the bus, and I'm like, I am not in prison. This is amazing. You know, I love this bus. You know, this is amazing. You know, um, and that's the exact same situation I used to be in. I've just allowed myself to change my perspective and go through this, like, change in this program and have this, like, idea that maybe I don't know everything and maybe someone else can help me get to where I still won't know everything, but I'll have a better idea of what I actually want out of life and what I want to do. And I mean, there's so many, like I said, there's so many things in my life that like I never thought, like I, I've started sponsoring people, you know, quite a few times and people fall off, but just seeing someone having the willingness to change, you know, is amazing. Like, have, like being able to have a, in, like, and it's kept me sober, so it worked. You know, like, it, whether they stay sober or not, like, sponsorship is about, you know, trying to 12-step someone, but also it keeps you sober. Like, doing service does that. Um, and that's why, even though I didn't really want to speak tonight, when someone, like, when the program shows up, I say yes, because I know if I want to speak, it's probably because, like, I'm feeling crummy about myself, and I want to make someone laugh, and it's just, like, about me, and I want to, like, pump my ego up or something. But when I don't want to speak is usually when it's, like, I really need to. And it's when I really need to get out, and I'm probably isolating a little bit, and I'm probably not working the program I need to, and going out and seeing everyone in a meeting, and people coming up and talking to you after a meeting, because they always do when you share, you know, um, yeah. <laughs> thanks, uh, <laughs> you know, that, that makes you really evaluate yourself, that makes you see where you are, and that's something that, you know, on a regular basis, as someone who uh, is fucked up, needs, you know, um, I, uh, like I said, I'm just in such, like, an amazing place in my life, and, like, I I think that, you know, everyone can make it. Like, I hate seeing people not make it to, like, I really think that, like, Facebook is only to, like, tell me about friends that have that died, you know? Like, it's one of those things, like, I see that, and it's, like, all these people that I'm just, like, man, you could have had this life. Like, it's available to everyone. It's not something that, like, you have to be in the cool club or, like, someone has to give you the secret password or something. Like, if you just really want to, like, change, it's here, you know? And that's why I... uh I've realized that I've kind of, in a lot of ways, become what I hated at first, was like an AA guru of like, you know, like, you can do this, you're the best, I believe in you, and it's like, and it's not because, like, AA brainwashes you, it's because, like, it works, you know, like, people follow this program and lives get better because it works, you know, um, I just want to, you know, thank, you know, uh, Lache for asking me to share, I want to thank everyone who's here, um, you know, again, welcome to the newcomers, uh, this shit works. Like I have some genuine, like, fairy tale shit in my life today, and it's only because of this program. So, thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So, if you'd like to help us be self supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.